Welcome to my YouTube channel, Truth Emotion Studios. Today, I have a guest that says a lot to some people and absolutely nothing to others, and that is Jared Bias. So I'm going to start saying, hi, Jared. Thanks for being with me. Absolutely. Thanks for inviting me. Would you introduce yourself a little bit? Yeah, so I'm uh, the I'm an author and uh, co-host of the podcast, The Bible for Normal People. So we try to take the best in biblical scholarship and break it down for everyday people. So that's mostly what I spend my days doing these days. This channel is all about spiritual abuse and breaking down theology is a huge aspect of that. Uh, and I like to talk with a variety of people because a variety of people experience spiritual abuse and wrestles with it. And I found your book, Love Matters More, uh, almost like a centering pep talk in the mornings. I've listened to it on my way to work. And uh, sometimes it uh, was quite emotion awakening. So I actually listened to it twice. And some of the, the, the stories in um, your heart they have really moved me. So thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I'm hopeful and I'm appreciative to hear that because again, it's my journey of wrestling with my emotions and not just being in my head all the time. And uh, that's kind of how my faith tradition would have, I would have been shaped by it. I don't know if that was their intentions, but it was all about how much you know and how smart you can be and how you can prove other people wrong and not so much that emotional connection. Yeah, certainly similar for me being raised in the Baptist church in Germany. Uh, and we have a lot of similarities, uh, but I would like to hear so much more from you. And let's start with, so spiritual abuse. If we go by the definition that abuse is abnormal use, then actually a lot of traditions or things that we do on a regular basis in organized religion could be considered abusive. But what has awoken you to the reality of spiritual abuse. Usually it's not those you know, everyday microaggressions or whatever you wanna call that, but it's glaring big things. And then you go from the huge down to, wow, how mm. is that for you? Yeah, I mean, I do think it is, has been a, a structural or systemic uh, noticing of, you know, cults of personality and, um, people in places that didn't have the emotional awareness or wherewithal to take responsibility for the authority that they had. Mm -hmm. And, and so that ended up being the organization ended up being a way to serve egos rather than serving others. Mm -hmm. And yet the language, what I think made it ab abusive for me was the language was such a, the, the words that were used were, this is all about other people. And yet when you looked under the surface, it was like, well, who's, who's actually benefiting from the systems that we have in place? It wasn't everybody. It was a, a very small group of usually white or almost always white uh, men. And that's who benefited from this whole system moving forward. So that was something I noticed early on. And then again, the personality traits of that are they were, they were smart. They understood Western theology. They uh, were good at arguing. They presented themselves quote unquote well. So there was these personality traits that I think upheld these systems. You have been a pastor in your own um, life for a season, uh, thinking you would never be anything else but a pastor. Uh, do you have encounters from back then that would be considered spiritually abusive uh, now? I, I think it depends on, on the one side of the spectrum, we can talk about abuse in the way you're saying sort of like this abnormal use. And then there's definitely more severe parts of that spectrum. So, you know, for me, I think some of the abuse was also maybe mutually reinforcing in the sense that I was really young when I was a pastor. So I was 23, my first pastoral job, I was 20. Um, and I was an associate pastor and led kids and led music and a lot of things. And then I was a pastor at age 23 in a congregation that was, you know, 3000 people. And they were just, I think, uh, an unawareness of what it means to put so much on someone like me. And, you know, I'm looking at it now thinking, oh my gosh, I was in situations of premarital counseling or, or marriage counseling. 
um, where people are, you know, having affairs and, and these things are then coming into my office and I'm supposed to deal with them. And I'm 23 years old and I've only been married for a handful of years myself. And so there was some of that, but I don't want to paint that as though it was just the people who were over me, sort of my, my bosses. Cause I was also under the impression that that's what I, that was what I wanted to do. Like, give me more and more responsibility, put more, I can handle everything, just bring it on and I'll do a good job. And I, I did do a good job, but I think I'm just now coming to realize the emotional damage that that did, like how challenging it was for me. Um, and I just sort of had to learn how to compartmentalize and shut parts of myself down and not, I didn't have the tools really to handle it on my side of the street, so to speak. So that would definitely be something that I experienced that was probably traumatic. Um, and I'm just now starting to maybe recognize and acknowledge that. Yeah. So you're saying that the system even caused you to be a victim of it. Usually we think of a pastor as the victimizer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But to be put in a position that you're utterly, well, you can't be qualified for because it's right. too much and information you don't have. And uh that in itself yeah is uh difficult how have you begun healing from that kind of trauma having to fix things that you are not qualified to fix right yeah no that's a great way of saying it and I, I would say i think that is a broader more systemic problem i don't think pastors are equipped both both sides i don't think they're equipped for what the job of being a pastor actually involves and the, the expectations of congregations are, are just too high. It, it just, it's not possible to, to, to be qualified. But I would say just from the education side, you know, we're in the business of people as pastors. And yet my seminary education was not much, it was some people and it was mostly books and learning theology. So I, I think that's part of the challenge. But for me, in terms of healing, I think over the last handful of years. One, it was just acknowledging that and saying, yeah. And, and that has continued on. Like I'm a fixer. I like to fix things, um, things that aren't my responsibility to fix. So it's been able to like process that and be able to, to start putting up boundaries in my, in my relationships, you know, family, close friends and recognize that part of myself and say, okay, what is a healthy boundary here and how am I equipped? And I can start to feel in my body when I'm feeling anxious or overwhelmed it usually is a sign that I'm trying to tackle something I'm not equipped for. Like I'm pretty good at the things I'm pretty good at and they don't create anxiety in me and they're not overwhelming to me. So listening to my body, those clues helps me to then I have a you know recognition and I can take a step back and say, okay, what am I into that I maybe ought not be into? Um, and you know, where are these things happening that they shouldn't be happening? What is the name of your dog? Zula. <laughs> what? Zula. Zula. Mm -hmm. Zula. What does Zula mean? I've heard the song, Songs of Zula, that is in a TV show. It's the most beautiful song. What does Zula mean? Well, I don't know. I don't know what it means other than my, it's my grandmother's name, Zula. Okay. All yeah. right. Okay. Well, so I heard you say, first of all, coming to terms with the reality, saying you were asking things of me that I can't um, possibly be able to meet. Um, and that makes me think of ego. You mentioned that word either, uh, earlier. How was it for you to come to terms with, wow, everybody thinks like I'm somebody, right? They look up to me. I'm, you know, these people that are pastors, they will not even to anyone not say I'm pastor such and such. It's always when they introduce a pastor, it's, that's become them. So you thought that was you for the rest of your life. How, first of all, does that feel like to be the person everybody is excited about and or afraid? Uh, and then how have you shook that identity? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I'm trying to think back to that time when that would have been. And, you know, I think there were two things that helped. One, was as good as it felt, it also felt really oppressive. And I was, I was aware of that. It was, it was overwhelming to have all these expectations and knowing kind of deep down, I couldn't, I couldn't meet those expectations. So that, that helped. Um, and then having people in my life who were will, willing to give me real feedback. I mean, I would say in this respect, my wife has been tremendously helpful because my wife keeps me grounded. She was not caught up in that. She does not have ego issues. And so 
just anytime I'd be like, look at me, like I'm preaching to 3000 people. She's couldn't care less. She just couldn't care less. And so that of course offended me at first. I'm like, come on, like, look at me. Uh, why aren't you proud of me? And she's like, well, if, if I'm not ever going to be proud of you for speaking to 3000 people, like I'll be proud of you when you're, you know, as you're a kind and compassionate human and like all these other very grounding things. So I, at first I was offended of that. I've since become extremely grateful for that and, and feel like it was such a gift for me in my life because I didn't have a lot of people like that. I had people who had this unrealistic idea of me. And so to have my wife who knew me well, and then to be able to over time recognize that she loved me for actually for me, not because I was a pastor, not because of all these things I could do, um, but because of who I was like that meant so much. It was, it was a real gift. So I think that's been really helpful, but I would say when I left, I felt relieved because I could kind of unload this burden of all these expectations and all these things. But I would say I went through a time of depression and it's been a while for me to acknowledge that and call it that. Um, but yeah, I mean, my wife was of course the first one to point it out. Like, Hey, why aren't you, you're not getting dressed until two in the afternoon. Like you're just sleeping all morning. Like you're, you're, you know, what's going on, which is not like me at all. Uh, and so I think it was only again in hindsight to realize like, yeah, that was hard. It was hard to not, on the one hand, I was so relieved not to be needed. And on the other hand, I realized just how much my identity was in needing to be needed. Um, and that was, I had to come to terms with that. And it took a long time of just slowly practicing other things and making sure that where I was getting my affirmation from wasn't in terms of how smart I was or how well I could speak to a large group of people. But for those things that I truly valued was, am I a person of integrity? Um, am I kind and compassionate? Am I loving people well? Those were all things that frankly didn't factor into my self-esteem when I was a kid because it was all about being smart, arguing well, protecting yourself, being uh, independent. And so this other side, I had to just practice and it took a long time. Yeah. You also mentioned the emotional aspect of it to listen to your body for sensations such as, oh, I'm feeling anxiety. Uh, and um, in my cult, if you would make expressions like that, you know, honest saying, you know, this rubs me the wrong way or I'm getting afraid or what, it would be turned into a spiritual problem on your side. Um, so I wasn't having enough faith or spiritual enough to hold the burden, you know, without complaining. And that's always when they knew that we still had something left inside of us that was all of us and we would complain. Um, but then of course you learn to not do that anymore. So to not listen to the body was for me part of the abuse, but then to begin to listen, I can very much identify with that. How would you, um, as a human being with a lot of theological information and life, a lot of good life reflection, uh, respond to someone being told that whatever your physical sensations kind of point you towards, um, how should people, how would you respond to that if they're being told that's sinful to look at? Right. Well, I, you know, I grew up in a tradition where we like to proof text, you know, Jeremiah 17, 9, that the, the heart is deceitful. It's desperately wicked, like above all things. And so there was this deep almost explicit, probably explicit, but absolutely implicit understanding that we don't trust ourselves. We, we are not to be trusted. We have hearts of sin and we are, you know, wicked from the beginning, from birth. And it just turned out though, that the only people, we could only trust the Bible, but the only people who could interpret the Bible for us were again, these old white men in pulpits. And so we had to trust them. And it never dawned on me to say, well, why can they trust themselves? But I, I can't trust myself. Um, and so, but, but that would have been a deep seated belief for my tradition growing up. We don't trust ourselves, you know, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your, on your own understanding. And as I've gotten older, I've just recognized how harmful that is. And, you know, theologically, it doesn't take much to actually completely reverse that. I mean, it's not a stretch biblically and theologically just to say, well, God calls all creation good, or even just a few chapters later in Jeremiah, God says, I'm going to change your heart of stone into a heart of flesh, and I'm going to write your law in my heart. And Paul in, in uh, Colossians 1 says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. So now we have Christ in us. We have this reformed heart. So why wouldn't I be able to trust it? 
Um, and so if we are truly a new creation, as Paul says, it's very easy to just say, yeah, you're a new creation, trust yourself. <laughs> so it, it, didn't, it didn't make sense to me uh, as I got older, but that took a lot of time. And, and fortunately for me, I kind of was a, a, you know, in this way, my ego saved me uh, because when I was younger, I just, I didn't trust other people well. Like I was kind of the arbiter for things. So a lot of that just rolled off my back. But, you know, my wife, a lot of people who took these leaders seriously and they just full, uh, just full on went into the deep dive of, of believing that they couldn't trust themselves. They couldn't trust. Like I always said it, but I was always kind of like, well, I mean, well, if my choice is trusting me or trusting you, I'm going to trust me. I'm just going to say I'm going to trust you, right? So, and in a lot of ways, that protected me, I think, from some of these more damaging emotional effects. But it did take a long time to recognize, like, I can trust my own instinct. To, to do that is not selfish, that God has created us in such a way that we can trust our bodies and our instincts. And maybe not all the time. Um, that's where community can be really important. The, sh the shaping of our experiences comes not just from inside of us, but outside of us. Um, but yeah, I, that was a huge, I think that was actually a huge turning point for me where I could, I mean, frankly, this is why we named our second son Tove. And I think I put that in the book. It's because it, it was a shift in us to say creation and us as human beings were good, we're not evil. And that was a huge theological shift for us. Yeah. Yeah, it sure makes a difference when you don't wake up in this bound to all go to hell world that you have to single-handedly save. Uh, do you wonder if your fixer, you said you're a recovering fixer of, I think on Facebook, does that have anything to do with the, the theology of uh, the hands, the, the blood on your hands, God will ask, you know, you'll be guilty of not saving people that you don't warn, that kind of thing. I, I don't know. I don't think so. It's not conscious for me. That mm -hmm. wasn't really ever part of it. I think for me, it's, it's the shadow side of, of a really good part of me, which is I'm a problem solver and I'm, I'm good at it. And I like doing those things, right? I like puzzles. I like figuring things out. So that's the good side of it. It's the bad side is when I emotionally get involved and become somewhat codependent. Like now, my well-being and your well-being are, are meshed and, and I need you to be fixed. Yeah. That's when it, it starts to go south for me. Yeah, yeah. I have a friend who uh, stayed in the cult when I got kicked out and for 10 years we didn't have contact because I was demonized and shunned. So uh, when she contacted me saying that she was now also kicked out 10 years later, uh, I asked her, why she stayed for so long because the story she told of her day-to-day -day life were so horrendous uh, and she said she knew that something was wrong with the, the the cult leader we were an evangelical personality cult but she felt god had put uh, her on his side to help him and i've heard that from other people also that they know you know this is not the best but um, now she is uh, finds herself in a reality of uh, not having been, you know, in a relationship, and it's just awful. All the things she wanted out of life are not there, and she's doing surprisingly well. But this um, it, it can turn into that. That's interesting. I hadn't ever considered that, but I would imagine that would be certain personalities are drawn to sort of broken systems thinking that they can reform it and they usually just get sucked into it. Yeah. 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 It came down to, she had uh, given 200,000 euro over the 13 years in the group and was allowed to eat for three hours of the day. And um, the, yeah, it very, a lot of nasty stuff, but that is to say that kind of glaring stuff opened my eyes to a reality that I was raised in. And uh, now, you know, could like the onion take more and more layers off and like, mm -hmm. oh, it's a lot of stuff we um, accept that is harmful. For me, I certainly felt like I had to save the world. First of all, my father, then everybody in the world and not just in my cult, that was from being very little on. Uh, yeah, so that was a huge part of the healing to come to terms with who is the savior who is the right. yeah mm -hmm. so, i relate to that yeah 
your book is it reminds me in a way uh, you as a person and what you bring of Krista Tippett because she also talks to so many people and when she shares her own thoughts it's just this beautiful um mosaic mm -hmm. of personal experience and then all these traditions or people other people uh, in their lives and that's wisdom really to to learn from other people so, <laughs> And that's what I recognize in you too. And um, the, the crescendo is kind of in the, the last chapter, but how has your reading the Bible lens changed? And I know I'm asking you a lot to paraphrase, uh, I believe 10 chapters. So how would you begin to answer that question? Well, I mean, I think the, for, first and foremost, the shift for me happened to recognizing that reading the Bible for me became a means to an end and not an end in itself. So for me growing up, the goal, they didn't say this, of course, but the goal of Christianity, what you got affirmed for was how much you knew about the Bible. So that was the goal. It, we didn't really talk about our daily life and how we are loving our neighbor or how compassionate we are. We just assumed that if you know more about the Bible, you will be loving your neighbor better. That was sort of an assumption. So we just got to start with the reading the Bible part. So for me then to to take a step back, and I remember this story, which I think I put in the in the book, but there was someone in the youth group who was, they were her friends were giving her a hard time because she wasn't reading her Bible often enough. And the reason was, is because she was doing all these amazing things kind of in her neighborhood and in the world. And it really struck with me saying, wait a minute, what in the whole point of the Bible reading is to equip us and motivate us to go do these things in the world, to love our neighbor as ourself. That seems to be the whole thing. And yet we've kind of gotten that backwards. So for me to see that the reading the Bible for me had become an idol, meaning it had kind of come at the expense of loving well. Um, and so that helped me to reshape my lens. Once I started seeing the Bible as a tool and not the end result or the end goal, everything else started shifting around because then I got to be more pragmatic about it saying, well, if it's a tool, it's a tool for what? What's the, what's the goal here? And then, you know, then these verses start to pop out. We start to emphasize some parts of the Bible over others. And we have Jesus in Matthew 22, kind of nailing what everything is about. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Everything else about the law and the prophets, the Torah and the Nevi'im, they hang on these things. And then I started seeing that everywhere. I started seeing that in John and started seeing, like all these verses that I'm sure I read a million times, but that wasn't the lens. The lens was how much can I know about God and Jesus, not how am I supposed to now go out and live this thing. Um, and so those that lens shifted and all these parts of the Bible just really started speaking to me in a way that they hadn't before. Your Jesus uh, quotation of you have heard it said, but I say to you, would you explain that concept? Yeah. So, you know, there's been this conundrum for a lot of times, especially not, not so much among, among scholars, but among uh, pastors and, and lay people of, you know, what's Jesus doing on the Sermon on the Mount when he says, you have heard it said, but I say to you. Uh, and it doesn't, you know, we, we seem to have this, we're trying to make this choice between two not great options. Either Jesus is not saying anything new. He's just reinforcing the Torah because, of course, he wouldn't go against what Torah says or anything like that. Or he's doing this radically, you know, new thing. Um, and for me, when we look at the, the context of the rabbinic tradition that Jesus finds himself in, in what we call the second temple period, this time that Jesus is living in, we see this would be a common practice where we take the tradition and then we add our own spin to it. We, we update it. We make it relevant for us today. And this seems to be exactly what, what Jesus is doing. You've heard it said, not now we need to get rid of it. It's we need to stay rooted in this tradition. Here's what you've heard. But I say to you, let me reinterpret this for you for our day and our time through the lens of my experiences. This is how I would read this now. And again, Jesus isn't doing something wholly unique here. Um, he's following in the practice of what other people would have done. So if you read the Talmud, say, uh, uh, which is kind of like the Jewish New Testament um, in some ways, 
what you have are these rabbis doing exactly that. Well, rabbi so-and-so said, but this is what I say. This passage said, and th but this is what I say. And it's a dialogue. It's a conversation that helps keep the text alive. Without that, we, we lose the steps of the ladder that takes it from 2,000 years ago to our day today. Now, to say, though, first, when you lose an eye, then the person who made you lose your eye loses their eye to if someone slaps you on the cheek, give them also mm -hmm. the other two. That doesn't seem like he's still rooted in that tradition. It seems like he's saying something very different. Yeah, I think only if you don't, maybe I don't want to be mean about this, but I think only if you don't know your Old Testament traditions, right? So if we are labeling, it's a very, I would say maybe anti-Semitic, but it's very at least myopic or one-sided view to say it's very Lutheran. Well, the Old Testament's all law-based, eye for an eye, but the New Testament's all grace-based, you know, and Jesus overturns this. But we have instances, take for example, the whole book of Jonah is this wrestling with what do we do with our enemies? And in that book, in, in our Old Testament, in that book, God is incredibly gracious and compassionate to the most uh, heinous of enemies that Israel had faced, right? So there's these depictions of the Assyrians who were just masterful torturers um, and what they do to their enemies to instill fear in all the neighboring countries is uh, pretty, yeah, intense. And so to have them be the, the character in this story where God is having compassion on them. And Jonah and God are, are arguing back and forth between justice and mercy and who's God's people. And is it just us? Like, it's very clear that within the, the Jewish story, we have both sides of this coin. It's not one side or the other. So Jesus is saying something different, but I wouldn't say unique. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm asking for people who are listening and who instantly have the voices of their leaders in their heads. I think that happened to me for years and years and years. And I would always be, if I would hurt, hear something that sounds too good to be true, uh, I would in my head be like, yeah, that's why, because I was taught that that's not the right way to look at it. Uh, so you're saying that in a way what Jesus said is he found the nuggets <laughs> and uh, emphasized those. Yeah, I mean, in some ways, I would call it the trajectory, right? The trajectory of where we're going in the story, and Jesus picks up on those and carries the ball forward. And I would say that's the reason I say it that way is because I think we're called to do the same. We pick up the nuggets of the Jesus tradition, and we carry the ball forward in a new way. There are issues and, and challenges that we face today that, that even Jesus in his day, and certainly the disciples, Paul, and these others who are writing the New Testament, they just would have had no category for it. There's just not, uh, you know, there's just no uh, context historically for it. And so what do we do? We can't just bury our head in the sand and say, well, this thing that here now doesn't exist. We have to wrestle with the text and try to find those nuggets and find those trajectories and say, based on this, how would, how do we think we might respond to LGBTQ people and how, how might we do these things? And to think that the Bible is black and white on that is to, to miss, I think, what the Bible's trying to do and, and our responsibility. I think we shirk our responsibility when it's like, well, here's our rule book and we just have to go to the rule book. Yep, line 27A, this is what we do. The Bible's not set up to do that. It's our human nature to probably want that because it's clean and neat and black and white and we get certainty and safety out of that um unfortunately our our bible doesn't do that right unfortunately and it's uh real fun to do that and feels good all the certainty until you're the one that needs to have something chopped off or whatever mm -hmm. yep uh, yep so that yeah when i became the shunned i realized ooh, our system is broken <laughs> <laughs> yeah when you're on the inside it feels real great and that's part of the challenge is having eyes to see from the outside, from the marginalized rather than from the center. Yeah. What about uh, the, so the pract practicality of um, let someone hit you on the other. So is that something that Jesus would say to us today again, or would he update that in another way? Or in better words, would we update that in any other way? Mom. 
Gehst du mal zum Papa? Papa ist in dem anderen Zimmer, ja? Äh, Im Büro ist Papa. Du musst durch die andere Tür gehen. Okay. Danke. Tschüss. Bye. Dann muss mein little Eden. <lacht> awesome. Ja, yeah. so, uh, now I have to get back on track. So the question of how much, oh, the turning the cheek and how might that be uh, updated or not. And I think, yeah, for me, the book, the Bible is a book of wisdom. And the, the key phrase in any book of wisdom is these two words that I love. It depends. It depends. So, you know, is Jesus saying, if someone strikes you on one cheek, turn to them the other cheek? Is that a universal, absolute ethical command? under all circumstances at all times. I don't even know how we would know that, first of all. Um, secondly, Jesus certainly doesn't say this is for all time in some absolute ahistorical sense. And thirdly, Jesus is saying it in a very particular circumstance, mm -hmm. historically and otherwise. Mm -hmm. So for me, I think the, the reinterpretation always has to say under what circumstance, in what ways are we being faithful to the spirit of the text? In what ways are we being faithful to it? Um, And so I think there's a definitely an it depends component because, and I say that very specifically with that verse, because that's been used against people who want to have a boundary set up emotionally and otherwise, who don't want to, what I call, uh, live by doormat theology, where the only thing we do is just keep taking more and more abuse. And frankly, you know, women and minorities have been on the receiving end of that theology. And so that's what I would definitely say that's inappropriate. Um, that's not using wisdom. That's not using this trajectory theology. That's taking things that we want to be true if we're in the center so that we can oppress others and then making it this absolute rule. Yeah. Uh, the part, um, you mentioned in one part that your mother is uh, of a native tribe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And my mother-in-law is actually also partly native. And I know that that has shaped her and her personality greatly to um, have just a different tradition background, but the mixing. So the mixing creates these people that are just so uh, fascinating when we would listen, if we would only listen. So what are some things that your mom would say because of the tradition or the wisdom that my people carried mixed with all the other stuff, um, what would, would you say is something that she would stand for that would be uniquely, but I say to you? That's a good question. I'm not sure. I think that's a tricky question because the, the tribe that I'm a member of, the Choctaw tribe, would be what's called one of the five civilized tribes. So that's that's the phrase, right? And I was just talking about this the other day. You know, my mom, and I think a lot of Choctaw would have worn that badge very proudly to be one of the five civilized tribes. I would have worn that badge proudly as a kid. But as I've gotten older and I realized, what does it, what does that mean to be one of the five civilized tribes? It's almost like, well, they were the ones who got rid of their culture fastest. Um, And, you know, every month we get a newsletter, a Choctaw newsletter, and uh, it's like a newspaper. Yeah. And I love getting it, but I cringe every time because there's a chaplain's corner and it's all Christian. And it's all, <laughs> yes, right, right. Um, and so there's this history of boarding schools and culturing and civilizing native tribes. And, you know, my tribe would have been one of the first to go through that process. So there isn't a lot there. It's more me now trying to reestablish those roots. You know, some of the things, I, frankly, I think that we inherited as a tribe is our reluctance to trust people, um, a just fierce independence. Um, and those can be strengths and they can also be real liabilities in, in relationships. So there's some strength to that and there's some liability to that. So. Um, Yeah, it's complicated for me. That's a, that's a very complicated question. I haven't quite figured it out yet. Yeah, yeah. The Ojibwe and the Kudere, something like that is uh, the background of my mother-in-law. Um, I think the perspective that she has brought into her life was uh, that they were considered vermin. She had many, many, many siblings. And in her town, she has experience from being little Uh, how the town would look down on her and her father and her mother for choosing to marry a man 
who is native, you know, why would she, she could have done better. That has been a very shaping aspect of her life. I don't know that that is uh, specifically her tribe's history. Maybe that, uh, you know, like you said, they would have proudly said, we are not vermin, we are civilized. But that speaks that they have the same kind of fear of, oh no, we're not part of this. Oh, oh. what's happening? We're good, we're good. I thought, I thought something happened, we're good. <laughs> yeah, uh, but I think that's part of America uh, of the deconstruction that ought to happen of our theology to also go back to what the heck have, I mean, I'm not an American, but I uh, live here and I consider this home. How, what have we taken from people and how can we maybe support them, find their voices? Yeah, it's funny that you say that because certainly growing up in Texas, I grew up in Texas and, uh, and my mom and her family grew up in New Mexico. So there wasn't a lot of distinction between being native and being Mexican. And uh, so they would have experienced a good amount of some discrimination. And even me, you know, the, I was darker when I was younger because I actually went outside more and uh, didn't just sit around talking about God and reading books. But um, so, you know, there was that there's just by the nature of the color of your skin, it doesn't really matter. You know, there you just sort of lumped in together. And and then there's all these derogatory things that come your way because of that, so. Yeah, yeah. Well, hopefully this is a time where we can say, but now I say to you something entirely different. Um, yeah, if it had said in the Bible and there is no native or Mexican, it's all, you know, God's creation that he thinks is just so precious. Um, yeah, that would have been helpful. So what about in your beautiful book, and the story of the Muslim in Kenya, I believe, who ended up not living, but he made the sacrifice that he was willing to do in the name of uh, brotherhood or you know family in among religions. Would you share more about that story? Because especially for people who come from the law, from don't touch, don't fellowship with, don't mm -hmm. eat with. Uh, that story is really a key, I think. Yeah, I mean, it, it really is a story of a, of a Muslim man who was on a bus with um, a group of Christians as well. And there was a terrorist group who came basically and asked the group to separate into Muslims and Christians so that they could kill all the Christians. And they refused to do that. And there's just this beautiful solidarity of saying, we know we're risking our life by not just getting out of the way. What you're asking us to do, in, in my mind, is it was such a microcosm of societal challenges that we face around solidarity, where we're asked to be in the line of fire and to risk our safety and our, uh, our health in some ways, our privilege. We're asking, being asked to risk that. And we often societally we get out of the way and say, yep, okay, Christians over here, Muslims over here, whatever it happens to be race or any other thing. Um, but this man chose, and, and a group of them chose not to do that. And they stayed mixed in together. Uh, and he ended up getting shot and died um, a, a short while later. And I think that's important. And I, I hope it was a bit shocking or at least a little provocative to say, for me, at the end of the day, love matters more. Like it matters more than the division of our of our religion. Um, and I think that's very scary for people because they want to know, usually we want to know what makes our religion unique because I want to know if I'm right and if I'm in and who's in and who's out. That's really what we want to know. And, you know, frankly, but, but in my experiences with people, they're not so much wanting people to be out. It's that they just want to make sure they're in. <laughs> and labeling people as out just happens to be a byproduct of, well, if I'm in and you're, you have to be out. Um, and that's how I can be sure that I'm in. And when we start breaking down those rules and that black and white thinking and talk about love and wisdom, and it starts getting really gray and that makes people really uncomfortable. Um, but I think that's you know, what it has to be uh, is that love matters more. And we have different engines for that love, things that motivate that love. For some, it's Jesus. Um, for others, it's other things. But I'm more interested in the idea that love matters more at the end of the day. Yeah. And so the phrase we have to uh, reinterpret the Bible is quite a bit in your book. And I know that uh, 10 years ago, I would have instantly turned it off, probably burned the book and said, what the, what the, uh, but obviously now I'm uh, in, in very much agreement with that. Um, do you get into a lot of 
well, maybe not so much personally, but letters, emails, how do the good Christians let you know that they don't care for what you're saying? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we get lots of uh, one-star reviews and emails and you're leading people astray and, you know, a lot of um, you're just compromising with the culture. Um, yeah, it's it's the interesting thing for me. I think the most hurtful thing for me in all of those over the years, I've learned to deal with it, you know, have much more of a harder shell now, but early on, it was the assumption that the only way you can come to the conclusions that we've come to is by not taking the Bible seriously, by throwing it away, considering it trash, not taking it seriously, not thinking that it's, it's important and couldn't have been further from the truth. It was precisely me being intensely uh, passionate about the Bible and what it is and what it isn't and what do we do with it that I came to these conclusions. So that's often been the, the hardest thing for me to hear is like the assumption that this is something that I'm just being flippant about because I want to go have, you know, whatever uh, sinful lifestyle they are imagining um, that I want to go pursue. And so I throw the Bible under the bus in that pursuit. So yeah, definitely lots of negative feedback, but that's all right. Yeah. Probably also a lot of positive. Yes, right. Exactly. And, and that's what, you know, I try to focus on is we're not interested in trying to convince people who don't want to be convinced, but there's enough people who, again, they've been taught not to trust themselves, but for years, they've had these intuitions, these inklings, these questions. I can remember all these things when I was a kid or reading the Bible and saying like, well, that doesn't make sense. And then just feeling like the pressure not to say anything or even bringing it up to a youth pastor. And they're just like, oh, well, it's, you know, don't worry about that. It's no big deal. And kind of like, well, it feels like a big deal. You know, you're reading along and it says Elhanan kills Goliath. And here I thought it was David who killed Goliath. Like, how do we have both of these things in our Bible? And just all these discrepancies that you're like, yeah. And, and so that's what I'm passionate about is helping people follow those intuitions that they've probably had for years. Yeah, yeah. I've also gotten a lot of slack for, for that. Is that a bad thing, getting slack? Hmm, I'm not sure anymore. <laughs> so they, I've had people question my intentions for encouraging people to listen to their gut as they maneuver in the world and with other people. Um, but it goes exactly all back to that certainty that we cannot trust ourselves and uh, need to find security elsewhere. Uh, so the man, you are good. You have so much goodness stuff to say. So I need to turn around and look at the clock now. So a few minutes, I, um, I'm thinking. Uh, so from all the guests that you talked to on your podcast, the Bible for normal people, who stands out or what was said that has changed you? Oh, yeah. Give me a minute to think about that. I mean, the first person that comes to mind is Austin Harkey around the lives of transgender Christians. And that was really to, to see the lens through which he reads the Bible was incredibly helpful because again, it's this decentering of saying, oh my gosh, I would have never seen that. And I, I would say the same with Miguel de la Torre who reinterpreted on the podcast, this parable of Jesus's about the workers who get paid differently over different times. And he, he talked about it from the perspective of a migrant worker. And I was like, oh, my, I would have never, my mind was blown. I would have never thought that that would be a legitimate interpretation, but all the pieces fit and it makes so much sense. And how we, how certain people will interpret it this way when they come from this perspective and how other people from that perspective. So those two stick out. And I think because they were two they were two perspectives that I haven't embodied or experienced. And so to be able to put my eyes or put my feet in their shoes and see it from their perspective, it would, it changed, you know, not very often do we have people who just completely change my perspective on the Bible. Um, and those were a few that did. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I had a lady once reach out to me and it was about, she ha knew she had to leave her church because her son outed uh, himself as transgender to her and that wasn't gonna work she, she knew what was in store for him at her church and um i remember how easy it was in my cult we just called it all you know demons and jezebel and whatnot but to actually realize you know it's easy to do all that until it's your family um 
that that is where this love matters more becomes a thing uh so where would you say are you leading people with the podcast what is the, the path you're on and why uh, is it good for people with a background in spiritual abuse to listen to the bible for normal people yeah so the i mean the podcast really is for people who are, have been shaped by the bible by a particular view of the Bible and to give people more tools to realize there is not only a whole, uh, there's a whole history of people reading the Bible differently than maybe the way you thought you had to read the Bible. Um, but there are people today with a wide diversity of views on that. And, and they're all under this umbrella of Christian. And, and, and so giving people that opportunity, just the choice and the freedom to say, hey, you know, you can still be Christian and think of it this way or that way or this way or that way, um, for me is extremely powerful. That's it, it feels liberative. And that's what I'm interested in. For me, again, loving well is has a liberation aspect to it. So that's kind of for me what we, you know, that's our background. We're nerds. We're trying to kind of use our nerd power as we can responsibly to give people a different perspective on what the Bible is and what we can do with it. Yeah, yeah. How would you contemporize the word, that's the thing, uh, sin? What is a better way, better word than sin? Yeah, you know, uh, we talked about this where, you know, sin is this metaphor and it has different metaphorical inputs throughout the Bible. So early in our Bible, sin is a weight, and that's often why we have the scapegoat, right? We put the weight of our sin, and we send a beast of burden, a, an animal that can carry our weight, out into the wilderness. And so sin is a weight, and we want to take off the weight so we can feel lighter. That's what sin is. It's a weight. Mm -hmm. And then we get into, you know, more around Jesus's day, and sin becomes a debt. So forgive us our debtors as we forgive those who... Uh, we have debts against. And so we have debts and debtors and a lot of Jesus's parables and talk and even Paul's, we, we're in more of a economical system. So sin is now a debt. And so the whole goal is Jesus pays our debt, right? So that's kind of the, the language that we use. So seeing even in the Bible that metaphors change helped me to understand that it's okay that we change the metaphor for sin as we move forward. And, you know, one metaphor that I hear a lot of pastors use today is, is health, health and unhealth, right? So health and wellness. Well, it's not healthy for you. It's, un it's unhealthy for you. And I kind of like that better because it gets us out of this black and white thinking, again, of what we're talking about. And it's funny that you say this. I was just thinking about going on a rant uh, somewhere on social media about this sin thing, because I keep forgetting people still think about sin in this black and white in, out. This is a sinful thing. This is not a sinful thing. And again, for me, sin is a wisdom concept, which always comes back to these two words. It depends. It depends. And so uh, it depends on a lot of things. It's this interplay between who I am and who I want to be in the world, you know, how I feel God has called me, but also that rubs against my community. So there's some accountability in that. So there's this communal definition of us figuring out together what is healthy and unhealthy, but I can't lose my personal voice in that. I'm not just going to do what the community tells me to, so I can avoid cults and other things like that. Um, and it's just this back and forth conversation of it depends. It, you know, For me, sin fits in the realm of Proverbs uh, more than in the realm of a rule book. It's an instruction. And my belief is, as a Christian, I don't want to be sinful. I trust myself that I want to be a good human being, and I want to continue to grow into being a better human being. Mm -hmm. And so I, if I trust that, I don't have to be hard on myself. I'm not a fan of guilt, definitely not a fan of shame. I, I'm not a fan of those concepts mm -hmm. because I feel like those are there to police me mm -hmm. as though I don't already want to be a good person. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, I just think there's so much more conversation around sin that, that we should have that brings it out of this black and white, you're in, you're out, you are worthy to be judged, you're worthy to be, you know, feel guilty and have shame over versus every time I do something wrong, it's an opportunity to learn and do things differently. It's this, it depends, the gray area. Um, yeah, so that's a little bit of my rambling. I don't have any good thoughts on that yet. 
I think, yeah, but your overview was already fascinating. The first, it's a burden, it's a weight, and we need, we know we have to get rid of it. And then the other, um, looking more of a, the financial uh, system where you something's paid and then you're okay. Uh, but uh, what, what, with the burden part, I'm thinking of Jesus and uh, the warning of if we lead, I forget the exact sentence, but with the millstone on the, in yeah. the, the lake, maybe you can mm -hmm. quote that better. And yeah. uh, the and that in context with the dead debtor, I'm wondering of, of sin, I have similar questions that you have, uh, that it's kind of, we're, we're, we're passing it on. It's like a contagious disease that we put something on people that hurts them that doesn't raise them up or sets them free and it binds them up and so we do that to each other uh yeah. and mm -hmm. we do that because we're not in tune with the source of life the source of love something like that mm -hmm. and if in our heart the idea that love matters more would um be truly alive then we maybe wouldn't act that way or if we had realized we acted that way we would ask for forgiveness mm -hmm. Um, and that all brings me to ask you, and you can say whatever you'd like else, what is the platinum rule? I've heard my mother-in-law, the native lady, mention the platinum rule. And um, so how did you, you, you came up with that in, in your world maybe, or did you read it somewhere? I don't know. I have no idea. You know, I, I love, uh, I had someone I used to coach who they, they loved uh, R&D, right? Which is usually research and development, but they called it rob and duplicate, right? So you just you take things from other people, you duplicate it, you know, whatever works. So I don't know where this came from, but it, it became a concept that was really important for me. Because again, it took the golden rule, it took it from being a rule and put it into relational context. And that's what I'm always trying to do. Love is a relational term. And when we're trying to follow rules, we can often eject ourselves out of that relational context. And it just becomes about following the rules. So yeah, the golden rule, you know, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, which sounds great, but it has its limitations because that centers me. The golden rule puts me at the center. I just have to think about what I would want. And then I will assume that's what you want. So there's no diversity in who we are, how we're built, our context, our cultures, our societies, our temperaments, you know, none of that is in play. So the platinum rule is do unto others as they've told me they would like for me to do to them, right? So there's this communicative aspect where I have to talk to you and say, hey, when I did that, did that feel good? Like, that's how I would want to be treated, but I understand that you wouldn't want to be treated that way. So the great example for me is like uh, my, my wife and I, when we fight, like I like to, I like to fight. I like to argue and connect. Like that's a very intimate thing for me. Like I feel closer to people after we have an argument. She does not. Right. But I didn't, I was kind of abiding by the golden rule, like do unto others. What would I want you to do? I'd want you to fight back and I'd want you to argue and push back and let's go after it. Yeah. And it took a little bit of not long to be like, oh, that's not how she, that's not, that's not going to be a way we connect here. Um, so I had to ask her, you know, how did that feel? It didn't feel good. I actually, I feel disconnected from you now. Oh, okay. So now how do we come to terms with this so that we're both feeling respected for what we both need and want? in our relationship. Um, so yeah, I would encourage, again, for me, it pushes this idea of sin and health um, and living faithfully into the it depends category, um, not the, well, all I have to know is what I would want, and then I'm fine. Like, you, it doesn't matter if it hurt you, as long as I can have integrity to say, I did, I followed the golden rule. Well, no, that's not good enough. We have this, what I call in the book, Love is at the intersection of intention and impact. Um, and the golden rule is all about intention. Well, as long as I intended to do something good for you, it should just be good. And we ignore the other side of that equation, which is impact. How did it actually impact you? Yeah, yeah. And that is where many people find themselves when they realize, wow, these people truly tried to help me, but they actually messed me up more. Right. Mm -hmm. And then when you bring that up to them, then what happens? Well, yeah, that, I think that's a key, that moment for me is a key uh, understanding on whether they were trying to love you well, or they were trying to protect themselves and their ego. Mm -hmm. Because if they say, I was just trying to help you. And then they say, but apparently I didn't. And I'm so sorry, please show me, show me the way I want to love you. Well, I want to do my homework. I want to put in the effort. Like, let's, let's do this relationship. And I'm going to put in the work. Mm -hmm. That's very different than I'm sorry that you feel that way. 
that I hate that phrase, <laughs> by the way. I'm sorry that you feel that. I'm sorry that you were hurt by my good intentions, yeah. but that's really your problem, not mine. That shows me they weren't interested in a loving relationship. They were interested in being right and being in control. And uh, I think those are wonderful thoughts to come to a conclusion with. <laughs> so Jared, oh, go. what were you going to say? I don't want to cut you off. No, no, I was just going to say, I can't believe it's been an hour. It's been a good conversation. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. And where can people find you on the uh, web? Yeah, so Jared Bias is where you can find me, but also uh, the Bible for normal people.com. We have all kinds of resources and things going on there. Yeah, and you have a t-shirt shop I saw. <laughs> And what was that one with the everybody, something about theology? What All was theology it? has an adjective? Yes. Yeah. What does mm -hmm. that mean? Well, it means that, you know, what, what we've done forever, right? So in seminary, whenever I read a systematic theology book, it was just called theology book, right? So when a, when a white man wrote it, it's called a theology book. When a black man writes it, it's called African-American theology. Uh, when a woman writes it, it's called feminist theology. But when a white man, we don't, I don't, I never got a book that was called white man theology. It was just called theology. It didn't have an adjective. And so it's another way that we've centered one perspective. So for us, it's been a, a catchphrase of ours for a number of years. All theology has an adjective. If you don't put a, an adjective in front of your theology, you're just blind to it. It's not that it's not there. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Thanks so much for your time. And um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, absolutely.